time to begin the Q&A session and we're not recording or we are recording we're not recording I'm not sure yeah thanks yeah that's a great question so just for the sake of the recording um, someone was asking about noticing really that the Buddha often speaks in terms of the absence of certain negative qualities or unwholesome qualities and they were wondering about whether that necessarily implies the positive um, just by virtue of something unwholesome being absent and I think it does and I also think he does speak quite a lot about how to cultivate the positive as well so for example in virtue in the precepts in ethical conduct we often inherit just this five precepts or the eight precepts to abstain from but when you read the suttas in more detail there's many passages that talk about the opposite and actually cultivating um, yeah, the opposite of those things. So, for example, in speech, there's whole passages that describe right speech. So the opposite of, for example, um, gossip or useless words is um, speaking words that go to the heart, that are uplifting, that are worth recording, um, that are appropriate and timely, that are moderate, considerate, etc., So it actually speaks about very beautiful qualities. And then the absence of um, killing um, and harming beings is to abide compassionate for their welfare, gentle, um, with rod and weapon laid aside. So this is very evocative, actually. And of course, there are many places in the suttas where um, in the beginning, it may start with talking about the unwholesome qualities to be restrained. But later on, it comes to the point where the mind's more purified. And then it talks a lot about practicing the Brahma Viharas. So cultivating loving kindness, compassion, uh, mudita, altruistic joy and equanimity. And there are practices to actually cultivate those. So I do think when there's no ill will, there will naturally be an arising of metta, of loving kindness, because fortunately it seems that the human mind is pretty good. You know, the human birth is considered a good, a fortunate rebirth. So it does seem that just by cleaning the mind, these qualities do start to arise, but we can always support them by actively cultivating them and making a very clear intention to develop them. And I think there's a difference with people who have that in their practice, you know, especially in the Thai forest tradition, I've noticed that it's not a common practice to do sort of the cultivation of metta, whereas in Burma it is. Um, but some people do, some teachers do, and they do have actually a wider outreach, which is really interesting because that quality of softness, loving kindness seems to attract people and seems to be a very good vehicle for spreading the Dhamma. So I, I think it's both. And I hope that sort of goes some way to uh, uh, answer that question. So many are coming, they're getting, okay. In 20 plus years of meditating, I've never been able to genuinely concentrate. Do you think it's the case that some of us can't get this? I seem to spend my whole sitting life practicing okay with being distracted. Or should I persevere? Yeah, I think for me personally, um, I have also not developed a great relationship with the idea of concentration for most of my practice life. And it started to shift when I realized that the Buddha is not actually teaching us to concentrate. It's actually a really unfortunate translation because the word samadhi means stillness. And that's the way it's translated in Chinese. It's translated as stillness. And it literally means something like samadhi, like samatha means calming things down. In the Vinaya, there's a section called the Adhikarana Samatas, and they're the ways of settling disputes, settling, not concentrating disputes, <laughs> not like rounding off all the people who are arguing and putting them all in one place and like making it all concentrated and, you know, focused. No, settling, settling, letting things settle, letting things go, letting things calm down. So I think this may be one of the issues here, because if we're always trying to sort of put the mind in a certain place, keep on directing it to where we want it to go, we actually develop quite um, a negative association with that kind of practice. And um, it becomes very difficult. It is very difficult to control the mind. Whereas the whole point really of this um, day retreat is to try to discuss how to put the proper preparation in place so that our mind is soft and receptive enough to simply receive subtler objects such as the breath. 
So it's coming at it in a totally different way rather than just sitting down and saying, right, I should be focusing on my breath. We're actually um, tilling the soil, if you like, in the mind, preparing the, the conditions in our heart to be sensitive enough, to be um, attuned enough to notice the breath and to develop contentment with that breath so that we can stay with it for longer. And it becomes a very pleasant experience in that way. So I'm not sure about the perseverance. If you're still just trying the same method, the same way to kind of grab onto that breath and focus on it, then I would uh, say don't persevere with that. Try to come at it slightly differently and uh, develop contentment with whatever is arising in the mind, but, but just invite the mind to notice the breath. Invite the mind. If the mind wants to notice the breath, it will. If it's not ready for the breath, it'll let you know. And then you can focus on different things. You can do your body awareness practice. You can, you know, keep on noticing the relationship between you and your meditation object, purifying that, checking whether there's any uh, wanting, craving, aversion in there and replace it with loving kindness, with gentleness, with letting go and making peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So the question was about acceptance and developing a certain amount of acceptance in life to the things that maybe irritate or frustrate um, and that that's a, a type of compassion practice. And what would be another step? So I would probably think of that sort of acceptance as partly compassion, but also more along the lines of equanimity. Like more along the lines of making peace with, being at ease with, um, accepting that things arise and pass away. So it's more to me like an equanimity practice. Um, and you said that sometimes, you know, that doesn't work, of course, because we're not enlightened. And so sometimes anger arises and you feel frustration, um, which we all have from time to time. And I think at that point, that's where compassion can really come in because compassion, I mean, the definition really, as I understand it, is the way that love responds to suffering, that's one of the definitions, the way that love meets and responds to suffering. So it always has this intimate connection with the Four Noble Truths. So when you're feeling that anger, that is suffering actually for you. And at that moment, mm -hmm. rather than trying to accept it, even though obviously it's not very acceptable, it might be helpful to just say, oh, this hurts, you know, to acknowledge the pain of that anger in your heart and to recognize this is uncomfortable, this is suffering, and to develop some compassion towards yourself at that moment, some self-care. Oh. So it's almost like the mindfulness of the anger is the, okay, this is what's arising, and the compassion is, how do I care for what's arisen? So it's adding compassion to that awareness. I think that might further soften these kind of, um, I don't like the word defilement, but these um, unwholesome qualities that arise in the mind, it will help to soften and undermine them, to put compassion in, in that caring and tender way. So that's one suggestion, but well done and you're practicing well. <laughs> Thank you, understood. Great. <laughs> so there's another question in the box. I'll try and do a bit of both. Uh, a question about sense restraint. I live in a very busy London and begin to notice walking around is karma if I notice less, restrain the hawk vision. But there's also investigation and inquiry. I'd be interested in your insight into how to restrain the senses and keep open to inquiry at the same time. Yeah, great. I'm so glad you asked this question because I wanted to make it clearer earlier that there are two kinds of sense restraint. I mean, this is my understanding. It doesn't say in the suttas there's two kinds. But um, one type of sense restraint is the first one, restraining your senses so that you notice less. So you actually allow less input into the mind instead of having hawk vision, <laughs> which is more of a kind of... Um, it can be a slightly triggered response. You know, the, the nervous system's overstimulated and you're sort of a little bit on the um, defense. I get that myself because I tend to take in a lot. And so I'm sort of aware of everything around me. And then I realize, wow, I don't need to let all that in. So one kind of sense restraint is just coming back and maybe focusing on, on 
one thing or two things rather than everything around you so that the mind can quieten down. But then you're talking about investigation and inquiry. And I think that is another kind of sense restraint, perhaps for a situation where you can't necessarily turn your mind away from a particular input. And at that point, investigation is helpful to see, okay, is the way I'm regarding this leading me to agitation, frustration, despair, or is there another way that I can regard this, you know, and use my wisdom to try and frame it in a different way? So I think that's more helpful maybe when we're, say, in relationship with someone else. Maybe you're talking to someone and you notice, oh, they've got, um, I mean, this is a really silly example. It just came to mind. I don't know why. Like they've got a, a big sore on their face and your mind just keeps going to it. And you're like, ooh, that looks, ooh, that's a big. And instead of that, you look in their eyes, you know, you try to connect with like what they're saying. You know, sometimes our mind gets pulled to something. And, uh, and we feel almost like we have no control, but remembering, no, I can, you know, adjust myself so that I look in a different way. Somebody that came to one of our um, sitter classes was very honest about this. They said that they were in a group with someone and they thought at first, you know, they had this instinctive response, like this person's not attractive, you know, they're, they're maybe quite ugly. Uh, and they, of course they recognized that wasn't a particularly, um, you know, wholesome <laughs> or kind sort of response, but it's an honest response. We think this from time to time, right? We look at ourselves and we think, oh my goodness, look at the bags under my eyes, you know? But then he said that when he was talking to this person and connecting from the heart, this inner beauty started to shine through and this person's features started to actually transform in front of them because they were seeing something so humane, so beautiful, so open hearted coming through. And this is the kind of inner beauty that actually starts to make us question our perceptions about what is beauty, what is ugliness, etc. It's something much more than meets the eye. Of course, that's a cliche, but it's really true. You know, somebody can have perfect features, a so-called societally accepted perfect body. And, you know, if they're angry, if they're full of hate, their features become contorted, you know, they age quickly. They, they look, you know, unattractive. They are unattractive to be around. But if we can cultivate those beautiful aspects of our heart, then, things change so in the same way we cultivate um, our senses to notice the goodness to notice the kindness the beauty if you're walking around maybe to notice the trees you know you could go to a city like London you can notice the traffic and the pollution the noise or you can notice that there's these beautiful plane trees everywhere and they're one of the trees that take out most of the toxins like they're one that absorb more toxins than any other tree and put out, you know, lots of oxygen. So it's very apt that they're in London. You can notice that, you can notice the sky. Sometimes you might even notice a bird or you can just put your awareness in your feet and, you know, be aware of walking. Mindfulness doesn't always have to go slow. So yeah, it, it's always a kind of adaptive thing. I think it's about noticing what you need from time to time. I hope that helps. It's a really huge field of practice and one that's very much about uh, everyday life. Yeah. Anything else? We have quite a bit more time. So please do feel free to ask your question. Simple question in a sense it is, and it's also a very deep question. So I'm happy to talk a bit about that. Um, I think you're right in both ways. Like when you said, is it something that will develop naturally over the course of practice? I wanted to say, yes, that's true. Um, because they are stages of letting go. They're not actually attainments. And I think it's a shame when they're framed as such, because that engenders a lot of striving, spiritual materialism, kind of measuring, you know, our progress, maybe against other people's so-called progress. But there's so much more involved than that. And the Buddha said, you know, that there's no jhana without wisdom. And there's no wisdom without jhana. So that's a bit of a conundrum, almost like a koan. But the point is, is that as the wisdom deepens, the samadhi will deepen. And as the samadhi deepens, it will enable you to see more and more. So the two things will naturally start to work together through the practice. However, 
in my experience, um, I spent the first 10 to 14 years of my practice life, at least, maybe 15 years. I've been practicing about 24, 25 years, um, doing the Vipassana practices. And that also included some breath meditation. But because my main perception that I was developing was impermanence and it was focused on an object that was changing all the time, it wasn't possible. There wasn't enough stability in that object to actually enter these deep still states of mind. So if we define jhana as a stillness rather than concentration, right? Absorption, stillness. Um, we need an object that's actually uh, very steady and that we don't investigate too deeply in the beginning. So I hope it's not getting too technical, but I think it's important to understand the difference between the kind of practices that will lead to absorption samadhi, jhanas, and the types of practices like the Vipassana practices, which will lead to a lot of um, sustained awareness, strong mindfulness, but won't lead to the jhanas that easily if you're observing arising and passing away. So the, the samadhi might be as strong, but it won't be as still and it will have a slightly different quality. So I think it's really helpful to get good guidance in Anapana and also the Brahma Viharas if you want to develop the jhanas. And the most important instruction that differentiates the jhana practice with the breath seems to be that you're not investigating the nature of the breath. You're not investigating the sensations in detail. You're not noticing the arising and passing away, but you're just seeing the breath as breath. And one of my teachers, Shaila Catherine, she's a jhana master and a really great teacher with lots and lots of clarity around this and lots of deep meditation. She says that it's like for the jhana practice, you just observe breath, the occurrence of the breath, just the mere occurrence of the breath and the fact that you are breathing. So there might be some sensation there, but you don't focus on that. You're just aware of breath. It's very simple. It's just like breath coming in, breath going out, just breath, the occurrence of the breath. And when we do this, the object becomes simpler and simpler, quieter and quieter. And that will lead you into increasingly still states of mind. But it will never work by forcing it, by focusing, by, you know, perseverance, concentration, etc. It will work more by refining your awareness, beautifying your mind, um, allowing the mind to become subtle enough, receptive enough to receive that breath. So I hope that's not too much or too confusing, but I guess I'm trying to say it's both, but that if you do want to develop the meditation into the jhanas, it's important not to do too much investigation in the beginning. I had to actually really withdraw from that perception of the breath just as vibrations. And it took me actually at least a couple of years to perceive breath as breath because my mind would naturally just break everything down. <laughs> that was the perception, you know, that was really strong in my mind, this perception of impermanence. So yeah, learning to just see a breath as a breath was actually quite a change of perception for me. So. I hope that helps. Maybe I should do a day retreat on breath meditation someday. <laughs> and also you can develop these jhanas through the Brahma Viharas, you are quite right. And that might be a more accessible route for many people because the beauty of something like a metta practice is that it has a natural pleasantness about it. There's a natural sense of warmth that arises. And also it's incredibly effective in overcoming the main hindrance to deep meditation, which is usually ill will, you know, some kind of aversion, impatience, frustration, you know, all the sort of from the coarser to the subtler versions of that ill, Ill will. And it's also good against craving because when you have metta in your heart, you, you're really contented, you're really satisfied. So metta practice is also a really nice way to start to calm the mind. And yeah, you can get into jhanas through the Brahma Viharas as well. I hope that's okay. Is there any clarification needed? It's a very common topic in all meditation circles, but I think it's, having said that, I mean, going into it and trying to differentiate it in that way has its drawbacks, because as I say, they do develop together. 
So it's not like you really have to compartmentalize it, but just that if you're doing breath meditation, just keep it simple. That's the main thing. So pretty much how we did it today, we did some body contemplation, but we didn't go too much into detail. We did it mostly to relax our mind and develop, to develop um, the wise ways of relating to our experience. And then gradually that led to simplifying and maybe some of you experienced the breath. So, yeah. <laughs> Good, someone else is asking a question. This might be, ooh, really deep one so i'll see what i can do uh ooh, well, three questions on here now i don't know if you can three. see them okay are <laughs> they the ones yeah okay all right so the first one a friend talks about connection to angels being guided or supported what is the place of devas in our spiritual path yeah there are devas i do believe there are devas and uh, some of my teachers talk a lot about devas. My teacher in Burma was always speaking about it as if it was just like, you know, going to the shop and buying a loaf of bread. It was the most ordinary thing for him to talk about. And after a while, I mean, in the beginning, it was sort of inspiring. But after a while, it was frustrating for me a little bit because I thought, well, OK, <laughs> you know, you're having a lot of conversations and, you know, seeing these devas and hanging around with these devas. But, you know, I just want to... Uh, I know when you to understand my suffering, <laughs> you know, sometimes it was a little bit, but at the same time, he gave me some really nice um, hints and tips. And I think, I mean, it's up to your friend. I don't know what path she's on um, and what sort of practice she does, but I would say in Buddhism, generally, we don't really encourage like having strong connection to the devas or trying to sort of ask them or um, ask them for guidance or support but we can um, consider them. And one of the things that my teacher used to say is that whenever you go to a place that you've not been before, I mean, in that context, it was like a new kuti in the monastery, a new hut, but it could also be like a new house. Then there may be invisible beings in that place. And it might be nice when you sit down to meditate to just say to those devas, to those beings, whether you believe they're there, um, you know, if, there, if you're here and if I'm in your space, I just want you to know that I'm, you know, that I'm just visiting um, and I'm practicing and I'm going to share the fruits of my practice with you. And he said that in this way, it, uh, it sort of befriends those beings and then they don't um, create any disturbance for us. And in the jungle in Burma, not really jungle, but um, what would you call it? Um, it was very rural, but there weren't that many trees, but it was, I guess, yeah, very rural in the sticks. Um, you did feel that there were beings, <laughs> yeah, because these places hadn't really been habitat habited, inhabited by people very much. So it made sense to me. Um, and it can be a nice idea, but I would say it doesn't really have a central place in the path. It, it's, it has more of a place in Christianity, really, because I think what, well, I mean, this might sound offensive or controversial. I hope not, because no offense is meant at all. But it is considered like a God realm, like another realm, a divine realm, in a way, a heaven realm. And so our aim as Buddhists is not really to reach the heaven realms. It's to actually go beyond all um, existence. And of course, it might be nice to hang out there a while, but if we put our sort of sites on those divine abidings, you know, that you can also access through the practice of metta. I think we sell ourselves a little bit short. So anyway, that's a little bit about devas. <laughs> so the next one, can you please speak about the distinction between the intentions of kindness and non-harming? Okay, so I think that's you're referring specifically to the second fact of the Eightfold Path, the three right intentions or motivations. So one is called Avyapada, which can be translated as kindness or benevolence. And the other one is called Avihimsaka Sankapa, which means like non-violence, non-harming. Um, and the way Ajahn Brahm describes that in sort of contemporary language is one is kindness and one is gentleness. So I sort of think of that as um, 
kindness is like the way we relate to the object and gentleness is the way we handle it. But this is just one way you could frame it. This is just one thing that came to my mind. So for example, we're aware of the breath, we're being kind to it, we're sort of regarding it as a friend, you know, looking at it, if you like, as a little being that's come to visit, it's a bit shy. So you're kind, you're warm with it, you know, you don't expect it to be perfect, you don't expect it to stay, you're just kind. Then the gentleness, the non-harm would be like not grasping the breath. So maybe how close you want to get to the breath. Are you going to go right in there and sort of hold it tight? Or are you going to like relax a bit, give it a bit of space? How much gentleness is needed? How much um, focus, if you like, is needed? And also I think the non-harming, the gentleness has this aspect of patience. So we're not trying to rush the process. We're just staying really, um, we're staying with it in a very non-invasive way. Yeah, so it's like how we're handling it. It's like you have a friend who comes to your house. You're kind to the friend by giving them tea, you're giving them, I know, chocolate, whatever you have available. So you're kind to them. But you can be kind and not gentle. <laughs> you can be kind to them, but then you can say, right, I want you to stay, stay longer. Tell me this, tell me that, you know, that's not really being gentle. So it's like you're kind, but can you also handle them with sort of spaciousness, with gentleness? Yeah, I'll give you this tea. You can stay as long as you like, you know. Yeah, you're not too imposing. Does that make sense? That's just one way to see it. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just that we have to use language to convey these different things. Um, so I don't think there's only one or two ways. There's probably countless ways to interpret them slightly differently. Yeah. Non-harming, I think often for us as people who tend to have a lot of inner critic um, can also be noticing how we're violent with ourselves. You know, noticing the kind of ways we think that are actually really quite cruel. The opposite of gentle and tender, it's actually sometimes quite cruel. You know, the way we speak to ourselves, if you could actually take that thought out and put it on the wall or give it to somebody else, you'd be ashamed, isn't it? You'd be like, wow. I would never speak like this to a friend. So that's also an example of being non-harming. Don't harm yourself by the way you use your mind. Okay. How can we contemplate the co-arising or interbeing nature of things? For example, how we ourselves came to be. Also, Okay, so this is already quite a big one. Also along those lines, how can we begin to get rid of the boundaries between things and beings and see ourselves as no different to the world we perceive? This is something I'm struggling to investigate without getting too technical and scientific. Thanks, Ben. Oh, maybe I was supposed to keep that confidential. Um, yeah, now this is an interesting question because that is actually a different interpretation. It's not an early Buddhist interpretation of dependent origination. This is more maybe an understanding from Thich Nhat Hanh or from Zen. We don't really have these terms co-arising or interbeing in early Buddhism. The process of dependent origination is actually the process within oneself. They relate to an individual's process from birth to death and, and future birth. So it's quite a different um, philosophy in a way. And yet I would also say that obviously there is interconnection between us. Obviously our thoughts, words and deeds affect each other. So in that sense, you could say there's some kind of interbeing. We influence each other, we affect each other strongly. I mean, the Buddha actually said that the whole of the spiritual life is spiritual friendship. Right? The whole of the path is spiritual friendship because we need the input from a wise person or a wise, um, you know, if, if not a living person, maybe from a Buddha that we can read their words, we can read the teachings in the early Buddhist texts. So we need this to actually um, give us a different way of looking and give us some inspiration on the path. For me, it's so important to have living teachers, living examples of the Dhamma. And I noticed that I'm different, you know, in their company. I read recently that um, one of the benefits of being around somebody wise is that their nervous system is very well regulated. And by virtue of that, it starts to regulate our own. 
which is really interesting, isn't it? So we resonate with each other in that way. And of course, you know, we affect wildlife, we affect the environment, we affect everything around us. So in this sense, of course, there's co-arising and interbeing. But I think that pertains more and the implications of that are more in the realm of virtue, you know, being careful about our body, speech and mind. How we ourselves came to be is, again, going back more to the Buddha's classic description of dependent origination. And I'm sorry to say that it started with delusion. <laughs> We're here because of a lack of wisdom. <laughs> Avidya, pachaya, sankara. <laughs> so because of delusion, we generate this will to be born, to be reborn. Yeah, it's called bhava tanha also, like the craving to be. So that is how um, consciousness then gets turned on and uh, the senses come to be and then we're receptive to all kinds of input in the realm of those senses and feeling arises based on those senses and sense contact. And, uh, and then we start to react <laughs> to those feelings, you know, with craving or aversion. But the point is really not so much how we came to be, but what we do about being here. <laughs> So what do we do when we're living sentient beings with all these feelings arising and all these reactions to our sensory input? We can either react with craving and aversion, delusion, create more suffering out of it, or we can respond with loving kindness, with compassion, with a sense of letting go. So this is where wisdom comes to be. And once wisdom starts to arise, craving starts to be undermined. And the whole process actually starts to change course. That's actually what the retreat that I'm going to be teaching starting on Sunday with Ajahn Pramali is all about. It's about dependent arising, how things come to be, um, how the process of suffering is set in motion, if you like, but also something called transcendental dependent liberation or dependent liberation, if you like, which is how we take suffering into the path from suffering instead of responding with suffering generating more suffering we actually develop confidence in the dhamma so actually suffering can be very positive because we suffer because we have you know distress in our lives difficulty in our lives it's like we look for a way out we look for a path and then when we hear the dhamma the buddha said yes there's suffering and we're like yes i knew it somebody says it they're not trying to lie to us you know this is how i felt when i heard the buddha's teachings it was such a relief it's like everyone else tells me why should you be suffering what's wrong with you and the buddha's like the suffering it's like yes of course you know how can you even watch the news without realizing that and so from the place of suffering this other process starts to arise quite naturally called dependent liberation and actually, maybe I'll just read, uh, shall I? I'm not sure I've got the right one in here at hand, but basically the Buddha says that um, because of suffering, we develop confidence in the teachings, obviously, if we get in contact with them. And then that confidence leads to joy. And he says, you don't have to make a volition, may joy arise. It's a natural outcome of confidence that joy will arise. Yeah. There's a few little things we can do, like we've been talking about today, to just increase that joy. Reflecting on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha to increase our confidence, increase our joy. But then he says, from joy, there's no need to make a volition. May rapture arise, piti arise in the mind. It's natural that from joy, piti arises, rapture. And this is getting now into the realm of meditation. This is kind of the path, in a way, into those deep meditation states called jhanas. Then further, he says, from that, there's no need to make a volition. May tranquility arise. It's natural that for one who experiences rapture in the body and mind, the mind will become tranquil. The body and mind become tranquil. And from tranquility, there's no need to make the volition. May contentment, contented happiness arise. It's natural that from a tranquil body and mind, this beautiful sukha, contented happiness arises. And then he says, from that happy mind, there's no need to think may samadhi arise. Yeah, this is now samadhi of the jhanas. It's natural that from a happy mind, one easily enters the jhanas. So you see how this path is a path from suffering to happiness. 
ever refining happiness and bliss. So it's a very beautiful teaching and it shows that we don't need to reject suffering, you know, but it's all about how we respond. So I hope that goes some way to talk about your question. I would, yeah, definitely think that the co-arising into being nature would have implications in terms of how we treat other people, treat animals, treat ourselves, treat our environment. But then to go deeper and to look at this process of dependent arising within our own body mind and to see if we can actually start to steer the course towards liberation from suffering for ourselves of course that's going to bring many other people along with you as well right so nothing's ever selfish actually in buddhism great so I think I'm going to leave it there because we are a little bit going over time and I think most questions have been sort of addressed.